Welcome, everybody, to another edition Outside Looking In. My name is Bruce Negger, and we're talking about the issues that emanate from Montgomery County and beyond. How you doing today? I'm doing all right. Can't complain. Had a long weekend. I was down by the Mexican border or down by Texas, Del Rio, trying to drop my kids off into Mexico. I figured this would be my new college 529 plan. If I could get them and if I could deport my kids and send them over to Mexico, maybe get them down to Honduras, and if they could walk back, I could claim that we've been separated and each one of us could get $450,000. I don't like to joke about immigration. I don't like to joke about people's struggles because, you know, people are leaving to come to the United States because, you know what, no one wants to be here, but everybody wants to get here. That's that's something that you got to think about, right? This country's so wrong that everybody wants to come here from somewhere else. They're willing to walk through Mexico run over caravans and run over police blockades to get here. Why though? Why are they willing? Because the potential here is for $450,000 per, per, right? I mean, Joe Biden, this administration stops sending mixed messages. And that's all it is. It's mixed messages. Don't come to the border. But if you do, there's a chance if you're separated, you can have a settlement. You won't earn You'll be gifted $450,000. Yeah, that's a hard struggle to get here. No doubt. No doubt. I mean, I, I, I don't doubt it at all. It's, it's, it's something I sure as heck don't want to do. But seriously, to come into this country illegally and be separated at the border, which, you know, is one of those chances that you take, you could be gifted $450,000 per family member, whoever's been separated from you. You know, when you come to think about it, the death benefit for a soldier is $400,000. And for a lot of other things, (laughs) you're not making that kind of money. I mean, seriously, a family could walk into the United States with a million dollars. Oh, Bruce, you're being cold hearted. No, I'm not being cold hearted. What I'm saying is, is that the messages that this administration sends are weak and no good. Because why wouldn't you try? Why wouldn't you try to come, right? Don't come, but come. We don't want you. We don't need you, but come. And the thing about the immigration thing that gets me all the time is everybody says, weren't your parents immigrants? Didn't your parents come in through Ellis Island? I'm pretty sure they had the paperwork for it. I'm pretty sure they could have gotten rejected at the border just like other you know people in 1920 did. They got rejected at the border. You have polio, you're you're not capable, you're mentally ill or whatever of that sort. You got sent back. There was the same chance of getting sent back on the same ship that you were on with the same passage in third class storage, 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 whatever it's called. I don't care. This isn't a lesson about the Titanic. But anyway, you could be sent back then too. So don't tell me about America and all of this kind of stuff with immigration and everything. We know about it. But the people who were coming in were checked at Ellis Island. They got off the boat, they went to Ellis Island, and then they got checked through, and their names were shortened and the whole nonsense. You know what's going on there. You know, and if you don't, read up a little bit. You know, immigration, this country was born on immigration. Of course it was. Who's denying that? I don't understand why everyone takes an argument and says it didn't happen. It happened. We know we're all immigrants. You know, it's so funny. It really is funny because I went to school down south. And I was called a Yankee and your northern carpetbagger and all of these kinds of stuff. And I was like, my family didn't get here till 1932, a little be- bit before, but 1920s, that's when they got here. Civil War, what the hell do I know about the Civil War, right? What do they know about the Civil War? <laughs> I mean, they were just trying to make their lives over. Just, they ended up in New York. That's where they ended up. Why? Because that's where the ship landed. If the ship was going to go to California, they would have been Californians. It's, it's that simple. I, but it's just, the, the, you know, everyone gets on Trump, too, about these border policies, the border policies. The border was hectic. He stopped it. Done. And, you know, you're not going to get me to praise Donald Trump, but you will get me to talk positively about some policies. 
You know, when things are out of control, I mean, when people are crawling over a wall, what do you do to stop them? You pull them down. You just don't let them go. I don't, I don't get it. I don't understand it. And this isn't heartless. This isn't cold. I'm not a brown shirt. I'm not, I'm not anything. I am a humanist. I do believe in people. And I believe in that people should have the, you know, treated well. But sometimes when you're overrun, what the hell are you going to do? You know, on the border, the border, the border, the border. Joe, have you been there? Supposedly he has been there, but no one can verify that because the guy doesn't even know where he is right now. And then the, the VP, right? <laughs> Let me tell you about the VP. She's probably at the border hiding somewhere. Different border. She's probably at the Canadian border. Hiding. Ask yourself this weekend, no matter if you have kids or not or whatever, is your job approval rating 42%? Let's hope not. Let's really hope not. Because Big Joe, you got a 42% approval rating. That is not good. What you were elected to do, you know, I mean, why did you want to be president? (laughs) Joe, why did you want to be president? You're in your twilight twilight years. I mean, did you really think you could unify the country? You're non-inspirational. And Democrats, guess what? He was the only anti-Trump. He was he was the other person. He fit the suit. That's why he won. Because anybody running against Trump in a democratic society who wasn't going to give away everything had a huge advantage and a huge chance. I'm not one of these stop the steal people. I don't believe it. I don't believe that happened. And I can't believe that he tried to circumvent parliamentary procedure. And Mike Pence, good for him, was just sitting there and saying, this isn't going to happen. Donald Trump, I don't believe in you. I believe in the country. I believe in the office of the president. I don't believe in you. You might have done some good with some of your policies. But you, you will not be king, not in my country. But Joe, seriously, I mean, it's ridiculous. It's absolutely ridiculous. And then he wants to push through this infrastructure bill did get through. I understand it. I get it. You know, the infrastructure, it's you got to build. You got to get things going. It's still a lot of money, a lot of money. You know, and and for disabilities, you know, we're going to put in all of this money. It's... (laughs) Uh, let me backtrack on that. I, what I mean by disabilities, I was reading that there's going to be a lot of stuff, so it's everything's accessible. Fine. has to be. The ADA put that through. Everything has to be disability uh, accessible, wheelchair, et cetera, et cetera. I get that. People, you know, it's got to be even. Got to be that way. But all of this money that's going out is just going to be built to, to get back up to what needs to be. Not moving ahead. Not getting forward. I don't believe it. You know, they're talking about uh, high-speed trains and you know, et cetera. I mean, it, it's really on paper. It's wonderful, but it's a bit of a fantasy land at the moment. You know, we're, we're more ahead in the space, space travel than we are in train travel, right? I mean, what are you going to do? It's like they said, and I, I base everything I have because this is my knowledge base is the Northeast corridor, right? Amtrak from Washington to Boston. You know, from Washington, from New York to Washington, it's a pretty great ride. It's a pretty good ride. You get there quickly, not a lot of delays. But from New York to Boston, that's a crapshoot. That could be four hours or it could be seven hours. Because what happens with Amtrak, even with the Acela, all the speed trains, is they're still going over public, uh, you know, New England transit or Metro North transit. They're still borrowing tracks from the local uh, transit authorities. I cannot see, I don't see how, where, what, when, between environmental studies, between people saying you can't take my land, and all of this stuff, whether the arguments are right or wrong, I don't see how you're going to make Amtrak improvements. I don't see how you're going to make it faster. And bullet trains, I, I don't see it. The technology's there, but is it really there? Are we ready for it? Are we going to do it? You know, we can talk and talk and talk and talk, but it's about time we make some plans and make them work. You know, because the talk is just, oh, yeah, we could do this. We could do this. We can farm on the moon. Now, shut up. Shut up with the nonsense, all right? Let's be practical once in a while. What can we do for real? What is real? And what is money that's being given that's just getting us up to code? You know, that that's not 
money that's pushing forward anything. Getting stuff up to code is that's like, oh, we got this kind of money. Oh, but we got to, you know, we got to repaint the house. So, you know, that's not really money for improvements. Now we're not going to be able to afford the new wing, you know, and I'm just breaking it down so you can see and what I can see. But that kind of stuff, it's like if you live in an apartment, you know, if we fix the bathroom, which we must, then we really don't have enough money to do anything else that we thought all this money was going to cover. So we're short. But again, you know, with my New York bias, I read the New York Post, so I understand it. It's I, I don't know what the infrastructure bill was supposed to do for Washington, D.C. area, Baltimore area, maybe high speed train between Baltimore and Washington. That might be a good idea. But again, where are you going to run it? Where's the property? Where are the lines? I mean, I, somebody's got to have some plans that are ready to go and say, hey, this is it. And here we go. But there's going to be so much back and forth just arguing not through my backyard. This is the kind of thing that people, you don't understand. And I'm telling you, if, if and New Yorkers understand for a simple fact, at least the people who live downtown or the people who worked in lower Manhattan, you know, when the World Trade Center went down, it took 11 years, if not longer, to get something going, to finish. I mean, obviously you have to honor and, and, and create. I get it. And believe me, I was there. I know. I feel the same way. I'm not run roughshod over the whole thing. But people are like, oh, it's going to be too tall. There's no things here. This, that, this. Everybody. There's consensus, you know? Robert Moses, everybody, the scourge of New York. Robert Moses, the master builder of New York, right? The scourge, right? He, he was going to ruin this. He's going to ruin that. Yes, he was. And he made some bad choices. But he's the only one who ever got anything through because he understood. He understood. He was not an elected official, so he could not have to listen to the public. He killed the Bronx, was going to kill the uh, the village in New York. But he also created 15 other bridges and five other parkways. And New York is pretty good damn transportation. I mean, just the Metro North, forget about the subway, right? A 24-hour subway but is what you need to be a great city, by the way. A 24-hour subway. Unlike the uh, <laughs> Metro down here. Where one time before I was just visiting, I took the metro out to Bethesda. I was in D.C. visiting uh, for business. So I go out to Bethesda to meet to somebody and I sit out there till dinner and it's like 11 o'clock, 1130. I go back to the train station. Zoinks! Closed. $67 cab ride back to like C Street. Wah, 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 wah. That's not what I was looking for. But, uh, you know, it, it's just... New York has infrastructure, but the, this is the best part too, all right? You want to talk about socialism and the socialists? Let's talk about AOC, Alexandria Cort- Ocasio-Cortez, right? She goes in there. She goes, this infrastructure bill wasn't enough. $170 billion to the state of New York, to the state of New York, and she vetoes it. She votes against it. Why? Because it didn't have enough green initiative in there. Uh, believe me, I get it. I understand it. But how do you representing the people of your district who got flooded out, by the way, who need the infrastructure for better sewers, better everything? How do you vote that down? You're not thinking about the people anymore. You're thinking about some cockamamie idea in your head. You're not representative of the people. You're representative of your ideals, which I guess, you know, you voted me in. I get to do what I want. But, you know, I mean, I'm fighting the big people. I'm fighting the government. To what expense? Sometimes it's not caving in if you're doing the best for your district. I don't get it. I don't get it. But Joe Biden, right? 42% Joe. Joe, 42. Let's retire that number. (laughs) No, Mariano Rivera or Jackie Robinson can't wear it anymore because it's Joe Biden's number. Joe, 42. He's out there trying to get this Build Back America bill through now. This is the second part that nobody wants. Nobody wants. I've never seen anybody, a country, less enthused by a bill. Pelosi's not enthused by it. Even the Democrats aren't enthused. They're not into it. They're not digging it. But Joe wants to get it through. It's like having a bad marriage and saying, let's have a kid that will make it better. Nobody wants it. Why are you doing this? Trillions and trillions of dollars. Stop spending my money. Stop spending your money. Stop spending our money. Infrastructure. How could I argue with that? Right. 
How can I really argue with that? We got to get into the 21st century. Again, as I said before, our space travel is more advanced than our just regular travel in a car, on a train, or in an airplane. So that, I can't argue with that one, even though it's a lot of money. But this build it back with the social programs and this program, that program. You know what? If you want to tax me and raise my taxes, you tell me it's going to pay down the debt. Maybe I'm in. Maybe I'll pay that. But that's what I think the American people want to see. Their money actually going towards something that's that's actually bettering our children. Not just climate change, not just anything of that sort. You know, these issues you have to get on board with. I, I, I understand But seriously, if you told me that my money was going to pay down the tax or the debt, the national debt, you know what? Maybe I'll put a couple extra shekels in there because I understand where it's going. But build it back better. I mean, (laughs) let's hear the yays. Mm. Let's take a vote. Mm. They won't even go yay or nay. They'll go. "Mm." I mean, I, 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 uh, that's the way I feel. That, that's how inside I'm feeling about this. But it's incredible too. Let's let's talk about the Democrats for a sec. My fellow Democrats, by the way, because I am a Democrat. Because I did. I'm trying to subvert from the inside. If you're telling me that no Republicans going to vote or a run in Montgomery County, well, I'm going to vote Democrat. Or I'm going to be part of the Democratic primary so I get to pick and choose and campaign for somebody who I think is going to be more like what I need in the majority, what people in the middle need than whatever. So I'm on the inside. I'm in the inside looking out, not the outside looking in. I used to be on the outside looking in, but now I'm on the inside looking out, looking out for me. Ho, oh, how you doing? But the best part about Democrats, my fellow Democrats, by the way, is they lose their minds when they win an election. Lose their minds. Oh, we're going to do this, that, and the other thing. Oh, it's all, it's it's, it's a mandate. It's, it's, oh, we're out there. We're going to change everything. And you know what else they lose? They also lose their minds when they lose. When they lose. How dare we lose the Virginia governorship? How dare we? The gubernatorial election. what, What happened? It was all racism. That's what happened. No. Stop. Stop it right now. And I mean, everybody who looks at the Virginia race, you got to be inside this beltway here and read the Washington Post and get the Washington News to understand what happened there. They focused on the state. Youngkin focused on the state and on the people. Terry McAuliffe, right? Someone was writing in the New York Post about, oh, he's one of the best politicians I know. He's a glad hander. He remembers your name. He's a great politician, blah, blah, blah. No, he's a great campaigner. All right? He's a great campaigner. But this time, he took out of the Democratic playbook. Whoa, what? What did you do, man? Youngkin's like, Trump, see ya. Stay arm's length. He gave him the Heisman like you wouldn't believe. He's like, Trump, you stay over there. You know, I appreciate the base and the people in rural Virginia coming out for me, et cetera, and so forth. But I'm going to win this in Loudoun County where the parents do have some voice or should have some voice in the school process. I'm going to win this for the people who don't want big government to just run roughshod on them because they think they know better. You talk about elitism. I mean, it's totally there. We know better than you. But the thing about it is that they don't campaign saying that we know better than you, even though it's the underlying situation and all of it. They say, oh, we're the party of the people. You are not the party of the people. You figure one thing out and you're going to run with it. But McAuliffe, right? This guy brings in Joe Biden, 42. Joe, 42, he brings in. And then he brings in Joe Biden. He brings in Obama. Well, you know, and let me tell you about Obama right now. You know, his his influence is waning, really, really waning. It's not because Obama says anymore. You know, Obama's starting to get marginalized in terms of just fading away. He's he's the new Bill Clinton. He's in what Bill Clinton was. Now, Bill Clinton, I mean, does Bill Clinton's name mean anything anymore to anybody? Not really. And Obama's on that. He's on that way. You know, he's more worried about the 60 year old birthday parties and stuff like that. But uh, I don't think he pulls as much weight as he used to. Let's just be honest about that. He doesn't pull as much weight as he used to. And then Terry McAuliffe brings in Randy Weingartner, 
the, the, the head of the teachers union. I mean, okay, teachers union is powerful, but it's not that powerful. And do you think, I mean, you're trying to counterbalance saying, hey, parents, he made a mistake. This guy made a mistake in terms of what he said. Parents shouldn't dictate what is taught in schools, and I'm not going to let them. It's out of context. That whole statement was out of context. But you know what? In this day and age, it doesn't matter. It just doesn't matter. It just doesn't matter. There's the sound bite. Kapoo. Done. I understood what he was trying to say. He's like, overnight. I mean, it's the same argument I have. Overnight, we're not going to change things just because parents are yelling and screaming. We, we've done studies. We've done tests. Da, 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 da. That's what we've done. But it was taken out of context, but he said it. And you know what? When you say something like that, there might be some truth to it. Parents shouldn't have, right? That's what he said. So he brings in the teacher union, the teacher's union president, the national one, to to campaign for him. (laughs) Really? That would have been as bad as Yunkin bringing in Trump. Because let me tell you, Democrats, you can no longer, and you know it, and I know it, and the world knows it, but it just doesn't make sense that you still do it. You cannot say, well, he's more like Trump than I am. No, kidding. Because he's more like Trump because he doesn't want to give everything away. You know, I mean, this whole running against Trump is is not working anymore. You got to get back to the issues. The the, the vitriol, the hate of Trump is still there, but you can't associate everybody with an R next to their name to be, you know, uh, with Trump because it doesn't work that way. It's so narrow minded. It's so it's so pig headed. Oh, vote for me because he's more like Trump and I'm not. But what are you then? What are you doing? How are you helping me other than not being Trump? I don't know. I'm not going to focus on state issues. I'm not going to bring in state people. I'm not going to go around the state. I'm going to bank on the big cities voting for me. The Democratic strongholds. That's what I'm going to vote for. And then AOC comes out and says the reason they lost a gubernatorial gubernatorial election in Virginia is because they didn't go progressive enough. (laughs) How misguided are you? Go back to your little enclave in the Bronx and just stop. You have no idea. You have no idea. And I will say this Over and over and over again, over again, all you got to do is watch a football game and understand we're really who we're marketing to, right? F-150s, F-150s, Chevys, Fords, everything, the truck, the truck, the truck. That's what America is. But no, you think it's all about progressives in the cities. It's not. It is not. And you know what? You better start talking to these people in the hills instead of chastising them and making fun of them and giving them southern accents, even though they live in upstate New York or Maine. Hey, uh, the hillbillies, the hillbillies, uh, they don't know nothing. Uh, It's the hillbillies. That's all the Trump people, the hillbillies. Uh." What makes it better with your city slang, right? All right. It's no different. Stop treating these people like idiots and start talking to them. You want to be progressive? That's a progressive idea. Talk to everybody instead of your little garbage base that you can all sit there and drink tea and wine and say, oh, yes, we're going to save every problem and we're going to solve every problem in the United States by just spending money and throwing it at it. You know, people need help, so we're just going to help them without them helping themselves. Oh, boy, if I, you know, Democrat, I'm going to get kicked out of the Democratic Party. Talk about Republican stripes coming through. But I got to ask you, is it wrong? Is it wrong for me to watch MSNBC on election night and see them cry and lose their minds when a Republican starts winning? Is it wrong? When it doesn't go their way, Glenn Youngkin starts winning. Oh, Virginia, what'd you do? You failed the United States. You failed us. You failed us. How dare you? How dare you on a national level fail us like that? This is a referendum on Biden. You know, it was a referendum on states, on state, on the people of Virginia. That's what the referendum was on. The people of Virginia spoke and they wanted what they want. 
not some national poll, not some blue wave. And it, I'm telling you, man, it's not even I don't even think Virginia's gone Republican. This is what I don't think. I just think they had someone who was talking to them instead of someone who's talking to somebody on a national level and saying, hey, we got to ride the blue wave. And that's why Virginia should be a blue state and I should be governor. I mean, come on, man. It's about states rights. That's why Larry Hogan is a pretty damn good governor. It's about the state. It's not wrapping yourself in a blanket of democracy, of democratic thinking. It's about the state. And if you don't want to understand that, then I can't help you. And guess what? That means you won't have a job come January 1st when the governor is being inaugurated. You know, and let me tell you, it's like the Democrats have a, a a party, a huge party. I mean, the Republicans are gloating, too. I listen to the station WMAL. It is a conservative station. And, you know, sometimes I'm like, pipe it down, guys. Pipe it down. You got the statehood in Virginia. I mean, and every they're, they're just as bad, it seems. You know, this is this is a show of a Republican wave. No, it's a show of the state just deciding that they wanted to take things into their own hand with a guy who said that you can have it. But the Democrats, right, they win the election. They got their guy. They got Joe Biden in the office, right? They got him. You got who you wanted. Maybe you wanted Bernie. Maybe you wanted Elizabeth Warren. But you couldn't put him up because they weren't going to win. But you got Joe Biden and you got 42% approval rating. So that means even Democrats don't like him. So I don't want to hear it. I just don't want to hear it. And then you talk about number two. Kamala Harris, I was reading somewhere that she's got a 28% approval rating. 28% for a vice president. (laughs) I mean, she's in hiding. No one's seen her. And she's got a 28% approval rating. What does that mean? (laughs) I mean, it means everything that she touches turns to garbage. I mean, how can you hide? And still have a 28% approval rating. I mean, that, that, that's what it says that everything, you know, I'm going to handle the border. I'm going to handle this. Women empowerment, all of this. You're failing everything. You're not following through on anything. The border, our borders, transportation, that's part of our borders. And, you know, it, it's a different situation. It's not an immigration situation, but it's stuff coming into our borders and unloading, you know. Really, it's first word problem, first world problem when you're not going to get your stuff for Christmas or you can and shipping from Amazon that used to take hours now takes days. But still, it's part of it, isn't it? And speaking about this, right, we can't get truck drivers. We can't get this. We can't get that. I was out on the weekend. I was I don't know where I was in Bethesda or Germantown, somewhere around the area. And I swear to goodness, I swear to you, there was more traffic on a weekend than there are on weekdays. At 9 a.m. or 6 p.m. There's more traffic on a weekend. So what does this tell me? That people aren't afraid to go out anymore. No, nobody's afraid to go out anymore. Yeah, COVID's still there, but we got to deal with it. I don't want it. I don't thumb my nose at it. You know, and in this county, we don't have the mask mandate anymore. But I am shamed into wearing my mask into some of these stores. That's shamed. But everybody else is. It's like, I I guess it's all because we feel like it's going to be coming back anyway, that the the mask mandate will be coming back because they that's another boondoggle. One day it's in one. You know, the minute we are able to take masks off, we go into high transmission. They say we're going to get it again. But this county council did say we got to go into seven days of high transmission before we get the masks back which is probably the first thing of common sense that I've heard that county council talk about. But, I, you know, I, it's everyone's afraid. Everyone's afraid. No, you're not afraid. You got lazy. You got comfortable. Let's just put it that way. You got comfortable. You know, there was an article in the New York Post about people staying out till 11 o'clock in the, at night on a Tuesday because they're not afraid anymore to have that nightcap. Because they don't have to go to their meetings till, you know, they don't have to turn on their computer and be in front of the, uh, a meeting till 11. So they have plenty of time to, you know, to have some breakfast and sneak in a workout. And the best part about that is like, I know everybody's doing that. I'm not saying, oh, Bruce is doing, you know, 100%. Sure, I'm, I'm you know, sometimes. Mm. But for the most part, I'm at my desk working when I have to be working. Trying to get it done. I mean, I've been in sales for a long time and I had the flexibility when I moved down here. I was working out of the house anyway, so I figured it out. 
The thing is, they turn on their computers and then they shut down their computers at the same time. There's no seven o'clock work for them. There's no like eight or nine o'clock work for them. Oh, I missed an hour at lunch today. Well, I'll get, I'll fix it or I'll get back to it at 9 p.m. There's none of that. They're out. They're eating dinner, but they can't go to work together, but they can gather in tables of 12 in fully packed restaurants with no masks, no anything. So don't give me this. And the best part of what I was saying before is that this girl, I forgot her name, but she gave her name and her job to the New York Post. And she's telling everybody, oh, yeah, I go out to dinner and now I'm not afraid to come home later because I can get up later. And, you know, I'll get on my meeting at 11 o'clock or so and no one's worse for wear. I don't have to I don't have to do anything different. It's not like she's commuting. Her job was like near her uh, her apartment anyway. She was only like 10, 15 blocks away. But now, you know, people who are staying at home and they don't want to commute, I get I get it. You have that time. You have the commuting time back. That hour, hour and a half, whatever. You have it back. But what are you doing with it? Are you being productive? If you are, good for you. But this girl's talking about going out and having drinks with her buddy. (laughs) And she's giving her what she does for a living and where she works and her name. Stupid. Stupid. I mean, there's no other word for it. Are people not afraid anymore of anything, of any kind of retribution because everybody has to be so kind and honest? Oh, it's okay. I read your name in the New York Post and I see that you're taking a paycheck without pulling in a full day, but it's okay. I can't really do anything to you, even though you admitted you're being a lazy bum. Ah. It's a lot to get fed up about. I mean, and seriously, I mean, this work ethic thing, okay, I'm not going to... I'm not going to sit here and say, you know, I don't even know what to say. I don't want to pretend. I don't want to pretend. And I don't want to be the one and one night you catch me out that I'm out there. But seriously, I wouldn't. First of all, just be smarter than that. Don't give your name. You could do whatever you want. Be anonymous. No, but I want my picture and my name. My picture and my name. That's not even like, oh, Janet, I, I, someone who sounded like you is in the post. No, your damn picture's in there. Identified. You're the wanted poster in the post office. They got you. I would like to see the follow-up to that. The New York Post should do a follow-up to that. Well, Janet was fired. (laughs) Oh, it's so unfair. It's so unfair, but it's okay. I was going to change jobs anyway. All right, Janet. What else is going on? My approval rating just went up to 51%. (laughs) But yeah, this back to work, you know, more traffic on the weekend than on the weekdays at 9 a.m. Or 830. Come on, America. Come on. Kids are going to get vaccinated now, too. And the whole thing about this vaccination process, it's if you're not going to take it, fine. I guess it's fine. I mean, what are we going to do? Let's just set up the ward for these people who don't want to take it, who don't want, you know, my body, my choice. There's your respirators. We got 10 or 15 set up for you. You fight it out. All right. You fight it out. If that's your choice. That's your choice. What what can we do? What can we do? I'm not going to... I'm wearing my mask so I prevent me from spreading the disease. I'm fully vaccinated, right? I don't want to get the disease. But hey, what's the point? If we're supposed to believe the science, what's the point? More mixed messages. Mixed messages, mixed messages, mixed messages. My son Ryan was talking the other day. He saw something on... I don't know, Reddit or wherever he watches his news, but he got the news. He was watching Rachel Walensky, the CDC director, and she's in front of Congress and they're asking her questions. And she's like, uh, I'm unprepared to answer that question. I'm sorry. I don't have these numbers. I don't. He's like, the CDC doesn't know a damn thing. I was like, welcome, Ryan. Welcome to the news cycle. Welcome to the news cycle. The CDC doesn't know a damn thing. Because they talk every day and they change their policies every day. Just sometimes there is too much information. You know, it's, you know, Rudy Giuliani did a great job in terms of 9-11, telling everybody what was going on, that the, the, the city needed to be comforted or just had to have information so they could see what was going on because there was a real threat around the corner. COVID's a real threat, but it's an airborne threat kind of thing. It's like, who knows where it's coming? You can't contain it. You can't have police track it down or anything of that sort. You don't need a conversation or press conferences every day to say people are dying and or their respirators. You know, it's just, yeah, keep us informed. But it, it, uh, I mean, you saw what Cuomo did, right? He press conferenced himself right out of office. Starts making jokes. Ha ha ha. I won an Emmy for this nonsense. I'm the king. You know. 
That's the great part of America. Once you think you're the king, you're out. Because then you start to slip up. That's the American way. What else is happening? I went out the last weekend. I went to go watch Penn State play football against Ohio State. If I ever do that again, shoot me. (laughs) I don't know. My wife went to Penn State. All her friends are Penn State fans. Penn State, to me, in terms of college football, is the most boring team I've ever watched. And I've had to watch them for five or six years. And plus, they got the Vanderbilt coach, James Franklin, so I got to root for them? There's no way I'm rooting for them. Stop it. I'm sorry. Bruce, why aren't you happy to pinch each school to touch them? Because I couldn't give a damn. That's why. <laughs> Penn State football sponsored by NyQuil. But anyway, I was out at the bar, right? Out at the bar. Got a beer. Beer comes. I have two beers. I have three beers. It's like three beers. 28 bucks. Youch. Youch. You know that progressive commercial, how you've become your parents? That's how I become my parents. Oh, 28 bucks for three beers? Ouch. I could get a cash and a six pack from shoppers. <laughs> I mean, that, that's what it came down to. I'm not out of touch. It's just, I. You know, there's certain things where the inflation point to me is where I stopped drinking it. I stopped having it. It's like six, seven, eight dollars for a bottle of beer. Seven, eight dollars for a bottle of beer is is over the top. It's over the top. It really is. I understand you got rent, you got this, you got that. And being in the bar business, I get it as well. But it's like once it crossed the Rubicon of $5, that's when I was out. And Diet Coke, right? You know what the biggest uh, impediment for me drinking Diet Coke was? What the biggest stop sign was? Once it got to be like two fifty a bottle. I'm not two fifty for a Coke. It used to be dollar eighty five, And then it got to $2. Once I have to put extra change on the table... I'm out. That's how I know I become my parents. <laughs> it's just, but that that commercial, by the way, if there was something I could work on, that's the new Dos Equis commercials, the most interesting man in the world. You know that they get everybody in the agency. Just bring your yellow pad. What do your parents do that we can make a commercial? And you know everybody's. There, there's no bad ideas in that. They're just ones that don't work as well, but there's just no bad ideas. That's a pretty good one. And then, what else did I do in this exciting weekend? Well, this was two weeks ago. This was a week ago. Uh, Went to Costco. Yeah, Costco. I like going to Costco to look at the clothes. I don't know why. I just like looking at the clothes, see what they have on sale. Because you can never have too many fleeces or hoodies, right? (laughs) It's my new work apparel. (laughs) But I'll tell you, no matter how many fleeces or hoodies I have, I still will wear pants with a belt. But anyway, I was in there and I figured out what Costco was like. I'm trying to get from one section back to the meat section where Gina was. And I'm like jumping from the left to the right, to the left, to the right. It's like human Frogger. It dawned on me. It's human Frogger. When I got to the meat section, I was next to Gina's cart. I felt safe. I made it across the road. It's like Crossy Road. For Frogger is for people of a certain age. Then now it's Crossy Road for the young kids. But that's what it's like. You got to hop here. Miss that cart. Oh, there's a person. Oh, here here comes the Costco truck. Ah, get out of the way. I did it. I did it. So just before I got on this podcast, and we'll finish up with this, the program's called Outside Looking In. My name is Bruce Negrin. You need to know that. Write it down. But anyway, before I finish up, my son comes down to me. He goes, Dad, Dad, do I have any government documents? I'm like, yeah, you have a social security card. You're 14. What else do you have? He goes, well, I need a government document to prove my age that I'm over 13 so I can get on a Roblox voice chat. Roblox needs to verify that everybody is over 13 and they need a government issued ID. Hold up. I'm serious. I I turn to him. I go, Ryan. I mean, there's certain things I hear that just make me mad right off the bat. It's like, uh, unbelievable. You know, we need to invade your privacy to protect your privacy. Uh, the kid is 14 years old. Other than a passport, he goes, yeah, if I had a passport, I could put all that information in there and show a photo ID. Or or all he's got is a social security card. I mean, maybe, but but still to upload it to a video game. And he goes, oh, I was just reading the privacy terms. And I go, tell that to Facebook. <laughs> 
I said, privacy terms. Yeah, the privacy terms on Facebook too. The, the privacy is that you can't sue us. You can try to sue us and you could probably take it to court, but we will crush you with multi-million dollars worth of lawyers because it doesn't matter. I mean, seriously, this whole thing about privacy, we got to take it for real. You got to be serious now. Asking the kid to put on an ID I mean, what does he have to prove that he's over 14? I said, put on your, your, your high school ID. There's your picture. You're in ninth grade. I'm not giving you any government documents. I'm not putting on my fo- you know. I mean, when people ask for your social security number, like in a job interview, what's your social security number? What do you need to know that junk for? How's that helping me? Just so you can reject me and now you have my social security number? You know, it's just, it escapes me. It absolutely escapes me. Again, this privacy stuff, we're giving away our privacy. My kid wants to get on Roblox for a voice chat, but he's got to be age verified. But the people who are age verifying aren't even part of Roblox, but they will guarantee your privacy uh, for 24-7, 365. Okay, LifeLock doesn't even do that anymore. How are you going to guarantee it? You're going to guarantee it until it's hacked, right? And that's, that's saying that you are just holding on to it in the vault. Instead of selling information. Enough already. Enough. Where's the backlash? Where's the uprising? What statue can we tear down? Let me know. Let me know. Program's called Outside Looking In. My name is Bruce Negger. We're doing this as much as we can. If you like the program, like it. Tell your friends. Tell your neighbors. If you agree with what I'm saying, even if you don't agree and you just think it's enjoyable, just go out there. Tell people, all right? Let everybody know. Let everybody know. Share it. If I if you see me on Facebook, share it. Do this, do that. I think I want to talk to more people because I really do think we've got to start something grassroots here. If you want to get in touch with me, the email is brucenice at yahoo.com. I had that email for like the last 30 years back when I was a little ill DJ. Yo, pretty nice. So that's brucenice at yahoo.com, bruce.negrin at yahoo.com. And or you can find us at Facebook at Outside Looking In with Bruce Negrin and or on Twitter. Not, not that I really use Twitter because I think Twitter's the devil. And we're on Spotify. We're on uh, Apple Podcasts. We're on iHeart Podcasts. It's just sign up, subscribe. Let it come right into your inbox. It's that simple, yo. That's simple. Your boy don't play. He don't play. All right, that's it. I'll talk to you next week. My name's Bruce. See ya. Oh, you thought I was gone? I'm not gone. Games people play. 